Now, I watched the Ric Flair documentary that aired on Peacock. It's a uh, nearly two-hour-long documentary. They had Tom Rinaldi in there, who was the narrator and the one asking the questions as Flair sat there in a chair and was interviewed about all kinds of different topics. They had a, a whole bunch of different talking heads in this thing. Hulk Hogan, Steve Austin, Triple H, Shawn Michaels, Mike Tyson, Stephen A. Smith, Post Malone, Booker T., DDP, Charlotte, Bruce Pritchard, Eric Bischoff, a whole whole bunch of different people. And it really boiled down to a very simple question. Who is Richard Fleer and who is Ric Flair? And it's very clear, as uh, Ric Flair has talked about, he doesn't know who that guy is. I'm not sure Richard Fleer really even exists anymore. There's Ric Flair, and other than that, you know, there really is nobody else at this point. It's kind of all just uh, one and the same. But I thought, you know, the documentary, it it was well done. But if you saw Flair's 30 for 30 that was done a number of years ago, or if you just know anything about his life and his career, I don't think you're going to get much in the way of new information out of this uh, documentary. And the 30 for 30, that was a 90-minute special uh, that that ESPN aired uh, several years ago. And I talked about it, I reviewed it on the podcast at the time, and that was a very good documentary. I felt like they didn't whitewash the man's career. Uh, And I like the animations and the reenactments in that one that they used. But Flair has made comments in recent weeks that this documentary would blow that one out of the water. He said, I was going to blow my 30 for 30 out of the water. I wouldn't go that far. I wouldn't say it blew it out of the water. And as far as new information, one thing that we did learn, and Flair himself only just learned this three years ago, he says, was what his birth name was. Up until three years ago, Ric Flair says he did not know what his birth name was. Because he was adopted. His birth name was Fred Phillips. Doesn't quite have the same ring as uh, Ric Flair. But he was born Fred Phillips. And he found out through uh, social media. Uh, this was this was fairly recently. Someone reached out to Rick's wife, uh, Wendy. Although they're, they're not really legally married. They're, so technically they're not husband and wife. Uh, They had a ceremony, but they're not really married. But somebody reached out to Wendy to let her know that he was born to the same uh, birth mother of Rick. So basically to let Rick know that he has a brother that he never knew of before. And he wasn't looking for anything. He wasn't asking for money or, you know, he just wanted to reach out because maybe he just found this information out himself. You know, they have all these people doing these DNA tests and everything. Who knows, right? The information that people can find out today is is crazy. But Rick said he opted not to meet him. He wanted to meet with him, and Rick said, no, I have no interest. Tell him I'm not interested in meeting with him. His logic was, I'm 73 years old. I'm not curious about the past. I've always looked at myself as an only child. I'm 73. What's the point in meeting this person who is a total stranger to me? So he had no interest in meeting this guy. But they had footage of a 60 Minutes report from Mike Wallace many years ago about black market babies. And apparently the orphanage that Flair was in when he was a kid was one of the places that babies stolen from their mothers were illegally sold. So it is very likely that Ric Flair uh, was a black market baby. So that was kind of interesting. I did not know that. I was not aware of that previously. And that was all addressed at the very beginning of the documentary. (laughs) You could have turned it off at that point. You're not going to learn anything new after this. It's only really going to reinforce, I think, what your existing views of Ric Flair may be. You know, they covered a lot of the stuff you would expect. They covered the plane crash in 1975, as I have many times before, where he broke his back in three places, and then he was back in the ring four months later. They addressed the four horsemen and Flair living the gimmick, him leaving WCW to go work for the WWF and winning the Royal Rumble and Bruce Pritchard saying that none of the WWF fans at the time knew who Flair was. So that he wasn't a big deal there as much as he was in WCW. Which is something that Flair himself does not dispute. That, you know, there were a lot of WWF fans who didn't watch Mid-Atlantic and they didn't watch World Class when he would appear and they didn't watch World Championship Wrestling and they didn't know from Ric Flair and what made this guy such a big deal. That's true. I was aware of who Ric Flair was, but did I have an appreciation for how big of a star he was at that time when I was that age? No, 
No, to me, the stars were Hulk Hogan and Andre the Giant and the Macho Man and the Ultimate Warrior and the Million Dollar Man and Jake the Snake and people like that. I was aware of Flair and Sting and the Road Warriors, but unless you were watching that at that time, you, you couldn't have, I think, a full appreciation for how big those guys were. So I don't think that's an unfair point to make. The point that Flair uh, did dispute that Pritchard said, Pritchard said uh, that when Rick came in, he thought he was going to be the biggest star or he wanted to be the biggest star there. Flair said he never went there with the idea that he would be the biggest star. He went there because he just wanted to get the hell away from Jim Hurd. After the way that he was treated in WCW and the way that all went down, he just wanted out. So that that he disputes. The Flair to this day admits that Hulk Hogan was the bigger star than he was. Hogan, meanwhile, in every interview, including in this documentary, goes out of his way to call Flair the greatest of all time. Even better than me. He's the greatest of all time. And I, I want to believe that he believes that because he says it so much. The problem is, it's Hogan. It's hard to believe anything that comes out of the man's mouth. He certainly didn't put Flair over when they worked together. And they worked together dozens of times. But they covered Rick helping to bring in people like Hogan and Savage to WCW. It wasn't Bischoff that did that. Ultimately, really, it was Flair. Flair's the one who made inroads with those guys to help bring them into the company. They covered the rise of the NWO. All the times that Eric Bischoff fucked with Ric Flair, including suing him for breach of contract when Flair no-showed an episode of Thunder to attend his son's wrestling tournament. Flair has always maintained that he asked for that time off well in advance. Bischoff says otherwise, and... He basically threatened to bankrupt Flair for it. He was going to make an example out of him. All because he missed a thunder. Thunder! To go to his son's wrestling tournament. They covered his return to WWE, the formation of Evolution, his retirement match with Shawn Michaels. No mention of his TNA run. As far as anybody knows, if you watch this, he ended his career against Shawn Michaels at WrestleMania 24. Although they did mention at the very end that he came out of retirement for one last match in July and then he was involved in another match in Puerto Rico and that he tweeted in September, I will never retire. That That's how they ended the uh, documentary. Then they covered his son Reed's death in 2013. They played the 911 call Flair made, which is still very disturbing to listen to. Uh, they talked about his four marriages. I mean, this... Uh, the man who has paid more in alimony than Vince McMahon did to buy WCW. This is a man who cheated death at least three different times, right? A plane crash, a lightning strike, and over 30 days in ICU where doctors gave him a 15% chance of survival. Actually, I should say more than one lightning strike if he's to be believed. He didn't mention this in the documentary. But he has claimed that he has been struck not once, but twice by lightning. The first time was in 1982, when he was the NWA champion. He was working matches with Ricky Steamboat. He had a match with Steamboat that night that he was scheduled for. And he was flying Eastern Airlines into Richmond, Virginia. His plane lands, and they are not letting anybody off the plane because it's raining so hard. Once the rain let up, they let the people off, and they gave them umbrellas as they came off the plane. Well, a bolt of lightning hit the, he claims, a bolt of lightning hit the top of Flair's umbrella, which sent the umbrella 50 feet up into the air. But apparently that bolt of lightning then bounced off the umbrella and it hit the guy behind Flair in the eye and killed him. Now, I have tried to find any news clippings that I possibly can about this because this is just an unbelievable story. Given somebody died, you would think there'd be a record of this somewhere. I can't find anything. It's almost too unbelievable to even think about, right? And maybe, maybe I'm just jaded. I just watched an entire season of Tales from the Territories. <laughs> How many fucking stories about eyeballs being plucked out of people's heads, right? We all know wrestlers, especially old school wrestlers, they tell tall tales. It's, it's hard for me to believe, you know, at least, look, the plane crash would be hard to believe if it wasn't documented, which it is. But this, this story is just unbelievable. But he has also claimed that there was a second time he was flying on a small plane. Uh, this was in 86. And I guess lightning hit the plane. And he claims that they went upside down. The moral of the story is when it comes to plane rides, don't ride with Ric Flair. Bad things happen. Case in point, 
speaking of plane rides, one thing that was omitted from this documentary. And ordinarily, I would say it's not surprising, right? I mean, why would they put this in there? Unless they wanted to do a truly balanced piece, why would they voluntarily put this in there? But I bring this up because Flair himself has brought this up. He was on his podcast. This was only in November. So this was not months and months and months ago. This is fairly recently. Flair was on his podcast. And he was talking about the documentary. And he claimed that the documentary would address what happened with the whole plane ride from Hell Fiasco. This is what he said at the time. He said, One of the most difficult things I've ever been through in my life, personally, aside from health issues, is having 85,000 people text me within two minutes that I was no longer on the opening of Raw or SmackDown after that bullshit from Plane Ride to Hell came out, which is all bullshit. It is explained thoroughly in my new documentary. I mean thoroughly. I am calling some people out big time. This is what he said on his own podcast. Now, on Flair's latest podcast, since the documentary has been released, they posted the video version of his uh, podcast on the YouTube channel they have for it. And they have timestamps. Well, there's one where he is asked specifically, did they leave anything out of the documentary that got cut or that you wanted to have in there? No mention of the plane ride from hell stuff or rebutting the allegations or anything like that, which is for the better. I mean, let's be honest, if you're Ric Flair, I wouldn't want to bring that shit up either if I were him. But why did he say that, that it would be addressed and explained thoroughly and he would be calling people out, presumably, you know, that he feels lied, and then there's nothing in the document, so he's full of shit, basically. He's full of shit. But they cover his health issues as well and... All the health issues that he has had. And he still drinks. He says he just wastes time until 5 o'clock every day. Because 5 o'clock is is happy hour. I guess you do that sort of thing when you've been drinking since the age of 15. But the man is 73 now. And he just doesn't learn. Even though he has had plenty of scares and has gotten more chances than most people could ever ask for. He still has not learned his lesson. This is a man who spent over a month in rehab, got his sobriety coin, walked outside and right into a bar a block away. And he laughs about it. Like it's all just a big joke to him. It's a joke to him. Except all the hell that he put his family through and his friends through. Especially when he almost died in the hospital and he was laying in there for 32 days. So... When this thing was over, again, I didn't learn much in the way of anything new. It pretty much reinforced all the stories about him that we've heard and whatever your thoughts are about the man. You you separate the two out. Ric Flair, as an attraction, as a professional wrestler, as a world heavyweight champion. When I think of what a world champion looks like, I think of Ric Flair. It is hard to argue against Flair being the greatest of all time. If he's not the greatest, he's in the conversation. And I can separate the man from the performer, and I can sit here and say that. Flair has had an incredible career. He's he's lived a very charmed life and has had an amazing career over a very long period of time. And I have a lot of fond memories of matches that he was involved in. I, I talk often about the 1992 Royal Rumble because it is the greatest Royal Rumble of all time and will never be topped. But when you hear these stories about him and you see it laid out there like it was here in this documentary, even though there were certain things that they did not cover, right? Like the plane ride from hell stuff, which became another, a big news story again this past year when it was brought up by Dark Side of the Ring. You hear these stories about him and his behavior and the things that he has said about people. He went off recently on Jim Ross because Jim Ross made a comment. It might have been on the Dark Side of the Ring episode. Uh, something about, oh God, what was the comment that Jim Ross, and it wasn't even like a a bad comment, but he was so offended by this, was Flair. He went on his podcast and he said, you know, and he brought up Jim Ross and he said, you know, even though JR calls me the greatest of all time, he said, I've lost all, res-, and he goes like, oh, Jim Ross lost his wife. And I know that was a tough thing for him. And I introduced him to his wife. I introduced him to Jan and he calls me the greatest of all time, but... 
because JR made this one comment on that episode, which he was absolutely right in what he said. I just can't remember what it was, the way he phrased it. It offended Flair so much that he said, I've lost any and all respect I've ever had for Jim Ross. Because he made that one comment about Flair. It was something about like how hard it is to be his friend or something like that. That's what he said about Jim Ross. He's been going off now the last two weeks about Eric Bischoff. Because of a comment that Bischoff made in the documentary. And Bischoff has gone out and said, I have no idea what set this guy off. He and I have had a rocky relationship over the years. But in recent times, even just a matter of months ago, we were at some kind of convention. He texted me, come down to the bar, let's hang out. And everything seemed to be cool between us. And now Flair's been going off on him. Calling him all kinds of shit. Dredging up past issues. This guy doesn't know what he's talking about. He used to sell meat from the back of a truck. And, and there are people who think it's all a work. I've watched some of these clips of Flair. He's not that good of an actor. Flair can be talking about something completely unrelated, and then he'll bring Bischoff up out of nowhere. And, and you watch him and his body language. The thing that really strikes me when I watch this documentary, for all of the success that this man has had over all of these years, and as revered as he still is by so many people, even in pop culture, and they covered that too in the documentary, he's in rap videos, he's got his own line of cannabis, he's at these award shows, right? He's at different sporting events in the locker room giving a pep talk to the team, like every everyone woos, right? He's this pop culture icon. He may be the most insecure person I have ever seen in my entire life. The insecurity issues that this man has had, really, it sounds like since he was much younger... I mean, it is incredible. And then the two different times in WCW and then again when he came to WWE where he lost confidence in himself and Triple H was trying to get him out of his funk. You're Ric Flair. What do you have to, you know, not be confident about? These self-confidence issues and insecurities that he has had, I mean, it shines through like a bright light when you watch this documentary. So that was something else that really jumped out at me. Uh, Flair seems to me like he's a transactional guy. If he can get something out of you, if you're nice to him, he'll be nice to you. Uh, there are a lot of stories I don't need to get into about him stiffing companies and people on payments over the years and stuff. And he himself has talked about being in IRS trouble and not paying his taxes. And Vince McMahon has bailed him out multiple times on that front. And Vince McMahon has been very, very nice to Ric Flair over the years. And Vince is another one. The WWE is another one where if they do something that bothers him, they took him out of the intro for Raw and SmackDown. I mean, you would think they declared World War III on this man and, and how this company is a disgrace, the way they disgraced me. It's all about him. And if you fall out of line with him or you make a comment that he doesn't like, it's almost like you're dead to him. It's very transactional in that way. What can you do for Ric Flair? So as a performer, absolutely the goat, one of the one of the goats. As a husband and as a human being, that's a very different story. To piggyback on this, Ricky Steamboat was giving an interview to Bill Apter on Sports Kita. And Steamboat revealed the real reason that he turned down the chance to wrestle Ric Flair in Flair's final match in July after initially agreeing to do so. He said, initially, Conrad, who is the promoter, we talked, and I went to Nashville. We had a sit-down. It was Conrad, his wife, me and my wife. I was still training pretty good and feeling pretty good, so I said okay. And we hadn't signed and sealed the deal or the money part of it. But what put the nail in the coffin was a week after that when I found out that Flair was wearing a pacemaker. All these years, I never knew. And I immediately just said, I don't think I want to do this. I don't want my legacy to be that I was in the ring when he happened to pass away or something went wrong. He says, I didn't want that. I've done some interviews after that when they found out that I said no, but this is the first time that I've come public with this. I didn't want to throw Conrad or Flair under the bus, so I threw myself under the bus. Even when I was talking with you, that I'm not the guy that the fans remember me by, and that's true. And I even said at the time he was doing uh, one of those virtual signings with High Spots. And the promoter uh, asked him about that. And he said, yeah, no, you know, it's not going to happen because I just don't want people to think less of me. I want them to remember me the way they remember me being in the ring with Chris Jericho when I came back in 2009. And that's a fine excuse, except for the fact that 
Steamboat just came back and did his first match, his retirement match, tagging with FTR at a big time wrestling show back in November. Right. So it's almost like, wait a minute, you didn't want to come back and have people remember you now instead of the way you used to be. And then three months later or four months later, you're back in the ring. And so now it makes a lot more sense. You know, it was a bullshit excuse. He just didn't want to be in the ring with Rick because like a lot of people, they were worried that this fucking guy was going to drop dead. And there were moments during that match where I was worried that he was going to drop dead in the middle of the ring in front of a live crowd. The end of that match when he was seemingly, he was sucking wind and couldn't even get oxygen into his lungs was fucking scary. Andrade had to physically put the knuckles, the brass knuckles on his hand for him. I don't blame Steamboat for feeling that way. But at least now we know the real reason why. 